Well, uh, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 24 today. We are going to take the entire chapter, which means I'm going to have to move fairly quickly through these verses because there's like 67 verses. This is a long story, but it's a beautiful story. How many of you, uh, and let's, let's be honest, there, no judgment here, no judgment. How many of you like a good Hallmark uh, movie? Raise your hand. All right. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, this passage today is going to read somewhat like some incredible ancient uh, Far East Hallmark story as we look at this. And it's just an absolutely beautiful chapter. But within this chapter, there's layers and layers for us to look at. And uh, it's really a chapter on marriage. And thinking about marriage, um, I was just reminded uh, about us. That's, uh, that is, okay, when you look at that, you can't call me Timmy. I was young then, right? That was uh, 30 years ago, right? And that's Camel and I, and uh, we started out in marriage. Um, you know, how many of you were there at our, at our wedding? Yeah, a lot of you were. Um, and, and just thank you for those gifts. We still use them. And uh, it, it, was a, it was an awesome day. And, I, and we thought 30 years, it's going to be just like this. But really, for the last 30 years, it's been more like the next picture. Um, <laughs> That's just reality right there, right? And uh, I, I look at this, and today, as we look at the, the marriage of Isaac and Rebecca, it's more like the first picture. Later, we're going to get to one of their sons, and it'll be more like this picture, right? Um, but as we look at this, it's just a great example of what God desires and is doing in our marriages. So let's just read this. I'm going to go through these verses and read and stop and comment. And then when we get to the end of that, we're going to look at, um, at three main points throughout this. Um, what is the name of this? Oh, Isaac, Rebecca, and you. Okay. I gave them like five different titles. I couldn't make up my mind, so I didn't know which one they put up there. Um, but this is what we read in Genesis 24, verse 1. Now, Abraham was old well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? And Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land, he will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham and his master's, uh, Abraham his master and swore to him concerning this matter. I, I just love this interaction that's taking place as you have in this story. It's a story of a father who is looking for a bride for his son. And within there, you see the heart of Abraham. He wants to follow the Lord. He's putting his faith in the promises of God, that God took him out of his land, or of the Chaldeans, took him through the Fertile Crescent into the land of Canaan, modern-day Israel, and that God promised him, this is going to be your land. You remember months ago, we read the story of how God had him up on a mount, 
and basically told him, look all around you. What you see, this is going to be for your descendants. And so Abraham, in needing to find a bride for his son, is just going to his servant and saying, go back there. Don't pick somebody from the Canaanites here. This is not what God called us to. Go back to my land, to my people, find a bride for my son from there. I like the fact that the servant, before he will give the oath, is talking to Abraham, his master. And he's saying, okay, but but what am I supposed to do? Like, it sounds good in theory. I'm supposed to go back there and, and I'm supposed to find this bride for your son. But what if she doesn't want to go? I mean, if she doesn't want to go, am I supposed to like then bring Isaac back over there? Take Isaac from the promised land back into the land that you called him out of? And Abraham, the father, is saying, no. Don't go back to the place you were called out of. And your offspring should not go back to the place you were called out of. This is now our home, so bring the bride to her new home. I love it. The, the, the servant's basically saying, like, what am I supposed to do if she doesn't want to go? I, I, I'm giving you this oath. You're saying, uh, you know, do this oath, put your hand under my thigh. It's a way that you see later in Genesis, the oaths are given as well. But I don't want to be bound by this. What if she doesn't want to go? I mean, then, you know, I, I can't bring Isaac back to that place. I don't really want to club her and, and force her to come somehow. And so... Abraham, the father, says to the servant, no. If she doesn't want to come, you're off the hook. You've done your part. Verse 10, then the servant took 10 of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master. What did the servant just do right there? He prayed. He prayed. Isn't that awesome? He's given a task. It's a daunting task. He goes to this city, and there's going to be women everywhere. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know who the bride should be. And so with this task appointed to him, he simply lifts up his voice to the Lord. Lord, Lord, um, will you please grant me success with this? I've been given a job. I have a duty to fulfill. I'm not sure how to go about this, but you know. So Lord, in this, will you grant me success? Verse 13, behold, I am standing by the spring of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, Please let down your jar that I may drink. And who shall say back, drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed to your servant Isaac. By this shall know uh, that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Isn't that awesome? He not only goes and asks the Lord to give him success in this, but he wants to be able to hear clearly from the Lord. He's not saying, Lord, uh, would you uh, let like a bright shining light come down and, and I hear your voice. But he is putting up a way that's going to test. This is how I'll know. If the woman that I ask to give me a drink also goes above and beyond that and says, hey, you just sit here, you rest, I'll not only give you a drink, but let me water all of your camels as well. This man had just gone on a 400-mile trip through a rough area, tired, 
exhausted, and he's praying, let this bride go above and beyond. Let this be the sign that this is the bride for the son of my master. Verse 15, before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, um, Daniel and Tali, please don't trash me for the way I trash these words, um, who was born to Bethuel, uh, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. The young woman, woman uh, was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, please give me a little water to drink from your jar. And she said, drink, my Lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water. And she drew water for all his camels. And the man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. Verse 22, when the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring, weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her arms, weighing 10 gold shekels and said, please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? And she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom, bore, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, we have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord. If you highlight in your Bibles, would you highlight that right there? That is the proper response when the Lord answers prayer right there. The man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord and said, blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsmen. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. Man, I can't emphasize that enough. Isn't that incredible, just this act of worship that happens? He starts out this process in obedience to his master. The next step of his obedience is to seek out a prayer to the Lord. He gets down some boundaries and guidelines so he will know if the Lord is answering his prayers. And when it is obvious to him that God is answering, he instantly goes to the Lord in worship, thanking him. He's not taking the praise for himself and saying, wow, look at what I did here. Look how successful I am. Look at this. No, he's saying, Lord, this is you. I am thankful for you and the way you have shown your steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, and you've done this for me as well. Just note, everything you have is from the Lord. Don't ever be so prideful to think that it's just by your hard work that you have what you have. There's a lot of people around us that work just as hard or even harder that don't have as much. It's from the Lord. And give him worship and thanksgiving for those things. Verse 29, Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban. Laban ran out toward the man to the spring. As soon as he saw the ring and the bracelet on his sister's arm and heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, thus the man spoke to me. He went to the man. And behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. He said, come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. So the man came to the house and unharnessed the camels and gave straw and fodder to the camels. And 
there was water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Then food was set before him to eat. But he said, I will not eat until I have said what I have to say. And Laban said, speak on. So the servant said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master. He has become great. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male servants, female servants, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And to him, he has given all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell. But you shall go to my father's house and to my clan and take a wife for my son. I said to my master, perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, check this out, the Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you and prosper your way. You shall take a wife for my son from my clan and from my father's house. Then you will be free of my oath when you come to my clan. And if they will not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. I love that in verse 40 that the servant adds in a detail that wasn't in the story earlier. That Abraham knew that the servant would be successful. Why? Because the angel of the Lord would go with the servant and prepare the way. Isn't that awesome? It just makes me wonder, like, how many times in my life is that exactly what the Lord has done? He's sent an angel or he's sent his spirit ahead of the things that I'm called to do to prepare the way so that ministry can be successful and uh, we have favor. How many times in your life have your prayers be answered and you didn't realize that the Lord sent an angel with you? so that you would find success. Incredible. Verse 42, I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you are prospering the way that I go, behold, I am standing by the spring of water. Let the virgin who comes out to draw water to whom I shall say, please give me a little water from your jar to drink. And who shall say to me, drink, I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, before his prayer was even done, behold, Rebekah came out with her water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew water. I said to her, please let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will give your camels drink also. So I drank, and she gave the camels drink also. Then I asked her, whose daughter are you? And she said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelet on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord and God, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you are going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. I love the decisiveness that you see with this servant. When he is told to go, he simply goes. When he gets there and he has presented to him, what he knows is the will of the Lord, he then just looks at this and say, all right, make up your mind. Will she be the bride for my master's son or not? Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, the thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebecca is before you. Take her and go and let her be the wife of your master's son as the Lord has spoken. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. And the servant brought out jewelry of silver and of gold and garments and 
gave them to Rebekah. He also gave to her brother and to her mother costly ornaments. And he and the men who were with him ate and drank, and they spent the night there. And when they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. Her brother and her mother said, let the young woman remain with us a while, at least 10 days. After that, she may go. But the servant said to them, do not delay me since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, let us call the young woman and ask her. And they called Rebekah and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess and the gate of those who hate him. Then Rebekah and her young woman arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now, Isaac had returned from Beer Lahai Roy and, and was dwelling in the Negev. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, who is that man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, it is my master. So she took her veil and covered her face. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And so Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. And Isaac said to Rebekah, don't cry, shop girl. Um, isn't that a beautiful story? And thank you for bearing with me for those 67 verses. Um, but this is more than a hallmark story. And just three words that I want to focus in on really quickly about this. The first word is marriage. Marriage. We see in Genesis, from the Garden of Eden, the very first marriage. God looked at Adam and said, it's not good for him to be alone. And so from his side, he created Eve, the first man, the first woman, and that is marriage. Not just biblical marriage, that's marriage, because the creator is the one who gets to define it. That's marriage. Now we have here in chapter 24, an absolutely beautiful example, a beautiful story of another marriage. One of the patriarchs of Israel. When we were introduced to Noah, we didn't hear about the, the marriage of Noah and his wife. When we're introduced to Abraham, Abraham's already, you know, been married for a while. And at 75, we, we meet Sarah. We don't see their marriage. But here, what we have is marriage. One man, one woman trusting in the Lord to bring them together in a way that honors God. This whole process is a process of, uh, of prayer, of faith, a process of worship and exalting the Lord with thanksgiving. That's marriage. There are many today, both outside the church and even people inside the church, that have tried to redefine marriage in all kinds of different ways. And you'll even hear 
people say, well, biblical marriage, what do you mean by biblical marriage? Uh, you look in the Bible and there's all kinds of, uh, of different types of marriages. Is that true? Yes, it is true. The Bible records the acts of all kinds of different things, both good and bad, both things that are pleasing to the Lord and things that are not pleasing to the Lord. Just because there is a a biblical example of some other type of marriage does not mean that God is giving two thumbs up to that type of marriage. You have to read the Bible as a whole. And from beginning to the end, marriage is between a man and a woman. That is what God called us and created us for in marriage. Nothing else. It's one of those things I could press more on that, but I think that you understand that and you get that. That would be my hope. And if you don't, come and talk to me. Over the last year, every time I I push on topics like this and I talk about things, there's people visiting and and checking out our church. And and sometimes we've had people come and visit and I'll say things like this and and they turn around and leave. Not this last Mother's Day, but two Mother's Days ago when I I said uh, in that service, you know, hey, I'm going to say something controversial today. I'm not sure why it's controversial, but to all the uh, women here, happy Mother's Day. Uh, I had someone that never came back after that and was angry because I defined a mother as a woman. The last time I brought up something uh, uh, about uh, marriage and addressed it with LGBTQ issues, uh, I, I had... Uh, one couple that will never come back to our church, and uh, another person who, who said, I, I, I completely disagree with you, um, but I am still going to be here. If you have questions about this, come talk to me and let's look at Scripture. And if you are reading a Bible translation that says that marriage can be anything other than a man and a woman, it is from a false teacher period. And there is a newer translation that retranslates things that way. It is completely false. Um, Come and talk to me about that. Let's talk about it. Brothers and sisters, this is a beautiful picture of marriage. This is what God wants and desires. Now, this isn't how it always turns out. Like I said, when we get further into Genesis, we're going to read about another marriage situation that happens around the same man Laban, and it's messed up, right? It's like, uh, you know, as Caesar said, this story is like Hallmark, but you go to the story of Jacob and what happens with Laban, and it's more like TLC or something, right? Uh, there's, it's, it, this, this is the model and the example. But let's go a little bit deeper. Is this story simply about a romantic marriage? No, 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 no. All throughout the Old Testament, we find that marriage is a picture for God and his relationship with the nation of Israel. You find it all over the place. And and notice this, it is a picture of that. It's a picture of that, not the other way around. It's not that God uh, one day was like, man, I I really want to communicate in some way how much I, I love these people and what my relationship is like. Uh, you know, angels, archangels, uh, you know, anyone got an idea? And Gabriel's like, I know, how about look at Rebecca and Isaac? I mean, you could kind of use that as an illustration. No, no, no. It's not like it just dawned one day on God to say like, ooh, yeah, that's a good illustration. No, he designed it purposefully to be an example of how he is towards his people. In the Old Testament, it's God with Israel, but in the New Testament, it transfers over between Jesus Christ and his church, his bride. So we get examples like this uh, in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, such a great passage. Let me turn there. At verse 25, we read this. 
Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. When you dig in that passage, uh, really what Paul is saying is by the Holy Spirit in, in a marriage and in a church, something happens. He says on the part of a bride that a wife should respect and submit to her husband in the same way that the church respects and submits to Christ. But he flips it around and he says, yeah, and, and when you look at Christ, Christ loved the church so much that he sacrificed himself for her to make her pure and spotless, without any sin, without blemish, his righteousness put onto us. And in the same way, husbands, that's what you do. You love your wife so much that you are willing to sacrifice and give everything for her. It's this beautiful thing, and Paul twists it together where he's talking about marriage, but then he gets into this mystery of theology to say, it's, this is a profound mystery, the way that, that Christ sacrificed himself for his bride. And that's the beautiful thing when we read that story about Isaac and Rebekah. It is an illustration of Christ and the church. It is the actual story of two people and their wedding and getting married, but it represents this. It represents a father who sends a servant to prepare a bride for his son. And I would challenge you, I don't have time to go all the way into it this morning, but look at that story again. This week, reread it and compare and contrast the things that line up allegorically with Christ in the church. Christ has a bride who has come out of one land and is making her home in a new land. That bride is anointed and set apart from the father. It is interesting because uh, in opposition, in contrast, you have here the bride having to travel to the groom, but Christ does the exact opposite. He is coming again for us. There are so many deep mysteries here. But just one more thing. I said there were three words, and the words are marriage, bride, but there's one other word that just hit me for the first time with this passage. You see Abraham at the very beginning of this, and that's it. Isaac, where do you see Isaac? He's mentioned at the end. That's it. Rebecca's in here, but she's not in the first third of the story. There are only two people mentioned consistently throughout the entire chapter. Who are they? God the Father and the servant. And the servant. He is the main player in this. Without the servant obediently obeying the Father, the bride doesn't come to the groom. 
I listened to a sermon this week by John Piper as he preached through a series in Romans back in the 90s. In his first sermon on it, he covered Romans 1, 1. <laughs> I don't know how long it took him to get through Romans at that pace. But it just, it caught me with this. Romans 1, verse 1 says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Paul, a what? Servant of Christ Jesus. Do you know that in Peter's epistles, what does he call himself? A servant of Christ Jesus. You go to James, what does James call himself? A servant of Christ Jesus. When you go to Jude, what does Jude call himself? A servant. John's just a different story. He's like, I'm the disciple Christ loved. But uh, you, you look at it and all these other ones, they're like, that's who I am. I am the servant of God. I, I am part of the church. I, I am part of the bride of Jesus Christ. But my role is the role of this servant that we just read about in Genesis 24. Sent from the Father to go help prepare a bride to bring people in. Brothers and sisters, we have a dual identity within the story. We are both Rebecca, the bride of Christ, but we are also that servant who's called, once we are the bride, to go out and find those whom the Father is saying, bring my kin in. Bring them from that country to this other country, to this new land. Why am I so passionate about preaching? Because there's the bride of Christ is growing. It's growing, and there's more brides out there that, that this father is saying, that one's for my son. That one's for my son. That one is for my son. Notice, as the servant goes through this process, he is obedient from the beginning to the end. Notice as he goes through the process, he's praying throughout the whole thing, saying, Lord, give me success. I don't know who to look for. I don't know, I don't know how to do this, but you know. So God, uh, will you show me who it is? God, will you let this person be one who will just come and will come to the Son? And throughout it, Lord, I'm just going to give you praise. And any success that happens, it's you. It's all you. Brothers and sisters, do you realize the incredible honor we have? That we have a dual identification. When we look around, we are the bride of Christ. And the Father is preparing this bride for his son. And how is he doing that? By his Holy Spirit, the angel sent before through his servants. How will you serve? Lord, I love you so much. And as Paul says, this is a profound mystery. So God, we need your Holy Spirit to drive this down inside of us in such a way where, where we can really begin to grasp this. What a beautiful story we read today about Abraham sending his servant to find Rebecca for Isaac. Help us to understand that it is a story of the father sending a servant to prepare a bride for his son. Help us to understand today that part of the process of preparing the bride in our story was the sacrifice of the son in order to make the bride clean. But Lord, we praise you because you had the power to rise on the third day. Thank you that ultimately we will be with you one day, that we will have a marriage supper with you. But until that day, Lord, help us to serve you by the power of your Holy Spirit, to worship you, to pray to you, and to trust that you will prepare your bride. Pray this all in the precious name of Jesus Christ, and everybody said. As we go into communion, there's elements up front and in back. We're going to sing a song. Christ said to do this in remembrance of him, so let me leave you with one last passage out of Revelation 19. Then I heard what seemed to be a voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, 
and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out. Read this part with me. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteousness deeds of the saints. And the angel of the Lord said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 